you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the ChrisVossShow.com. The Chris Voss Show. Dot com. And if you don't know it's the Chris Voss Show dot com, what the hell have you been listening to for the last 12 years? I mean, really, seriously. Like, uh, do I have to tell you anymore what show this is? Anyway, guys, we have an amazing author on the show. She's going to be talking about her new book, Sentient, How Animals Illuminate the Wonder of Our Human Senses. Comes out on February 22nd, 22. That's funny. We just had someone on the show yesterday who's the same day. So that's got to be easy to remember. 2-22-22. 22. How's that for awesome? Jackie Higgins is on the show. She's going to be talking about her new book. You want to pre-order this so you can get it uh, wherever fine books are sold and take advantage of uh, reading it first in your book club. But before we get into her and what she does, she's a Oxford University uh, graduate in zoology. So when we're talking to her, it's going to be a really smart discussion. Uh, but to uh, maintain, make sure you capture all that smartness, go to youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. Hit the bell notification button. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss. See everything we're reading, reviewing. Go to all of our groups, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and also go see the massive uh, LinkedIn group news that we have. That thing is killing over there in our 132,000 LinkedIn group that's under the name of Jackie is going to be with us. She's a graduate of Oxford. Oxford University in zoology, and she's worked for Oxford Scientific Films for over a decade, along with National Geographic, PBS Nova, and the Discovery Channel. She has also written, directed, and produced films at the BBC Science Department. She lives in London with her family, but she took some time away from them to come on her show today. Welcome to the show, Jackie. How are you? Very well, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. We certainly appreciate it. Are you are you're coming from us from London right now? No, I'm no, I'm somewhere near the Welsh Hills, so ah. it's all dark outside at the moment. But if you look out the window, you can see a little river and a little wood, full ah. of and herons on the water, and the occasional kingfisher if you're lucky. There you go. So we're still coming to us from across the pond, as it were, as, they, as I like to call. So give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs. So you can find me on um, Instagram and on Twitter. Mm. Oh, awesome sauce. Do you want to give the the, the Twitter profile oh, uh, handle name? Yes, J.M. Higgins or J.M. underscore Higgins. I should know you this. <laughs> you just want to make people work for it. I, I see what's going on. Yeah, okay. I'm there somewhere. So uh, what motivated you want to write this? So I, like you said in your fantastic intro of me, I, I studied zoology at Oxford, and I've always been interested in looking at the animal kingdom to better understand ourselves. So I think of zoology as a mirror, that we can hold up to more clearly see ourselves. You and I are related. We're distant cousins. And we're distant cousins of every other human that's walking the planet here today, in the Ukraine, in London, in America, and past and present. But also the same goes for animals and my dog, the lettuce I had at lunch. And so it's this idea that I see the animal kingdom as one big sprawling, or all life on earth as one big sprawling family. And I use, the, in the book, I use them to better understand ourselves. Mm. So me eating that salad is, I'm eating my relatives? Yeah, some, some are more close than others. They had a, <laughs> the they salad had a, leaves. They're, the, they're awful relatives. I think yeah, they, they had it coming. So are you, are you, on scum. Yeah, well, you got you got those awesome relatives, the, 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 the people you don't talk to at the uh, Thanksgiving dinner at the uh, family gathering there. It's always Uncle Joe who wants to hug all the women a little too hard uh, and sit on and have everyone sit on his lap. Yeah, <laughs> scars from my childhood. Anyway, enough jokes. Oh, well, let's let's let's. Oh, OK, well, no, we'll get on with your book. Well, a sense of experience. My... So the reason, so sentient is about how we sense the world. And this, and this myth set up by Aristotle in 350 BCE, that we have five senses. So we all have learned to parrot this from nursery, that we see mm -hmm. and we hear and we smell and mm -hmm. we taste and we touch. And you think that those, are the, those senses circumscribe our sensory experience. But um, 
and this 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 myth is 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 commonplace today both in kind of conversations and nurseries but also in scientific circles and yet we all know that scientists know that there are very many other senses that we use mm -hmm. the senses that we know and love have split and splintered into different senses mm. and also there are senses that we use that we're not so conscious of mm. um, so i explore this idea of the different senses and i use animals because because our every waking moment is circumscribed by these senses, we take them for granted. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, we aren't really aware of what we're doing when we're seeing even colour, shadow. Anyway, so so I use animals to get a bit of distance on ourselves so that we kind of take note about how we're seeing colour or we take note about how we're hearing and whether we're using two ears to hear. And so, mm -hmm. so the animals give us a little bit of distance on ourselves to appreciate ourselves as well. Yeah, because so we're idea. really... We're really animals when it comes down to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Especially some people on some of that. Um, more than others. One, that one wing of the politics. I don't know. I'm just doing jokes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, have you seen yeah. it lately? No, I'm just kidding. So let's talk about exceptional animal senses. What what uh, what sort of, actually, if you don't mind, I want to interject because off of your bio. Are you, so are you one of the people who's responsible for all those nature things where, where they're like, and the wild in animal the is in the grass. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, I used to ah. make, uh, I'm afraid so. <laughs> I used to make wildlife films. So I used to ah. make scientific films, as you said, mm. making, you know, explorers and specials for Nat Geo. I made a few films out in the States. We made a wonderful, if I don't say so myself, a wonderful special on the Sonora Desert. That was one of my favorites. So yes, and when I started making wildlife films, there was this amazing series called Super Sense over mm. in Britain. I'm sure it came to the States. Mm. Um, and that was how, and that was about animals, extraordinary ways of um, sensing the world. Mm. So that also, so the color of that, the kind of the mantis shrimp's extraordinary color vision or the star-nosed mole's exceptional ability to t feel its way through underground burrows or the octopus's exceptional sense of body mm. and using these exceptional senses to understand less exceptional se senses. But when you think about them, we too are rather wonderful. Mm. Well, well some of us, some of us more or less than others. Some of us more than others. <laughs> so uh, let's not let's not give some people too much credit. So let's talk about these exceptional animal senses. Like, what what are some other examples of of sensory abilities that you find in the animal kingdom? So, so let me think. So, for example, one of the chapters on touch is on the vampire bat, mm -hmm. and the vampire bat is able, with its nose leaf, to sense such fine changes in temperature that it can actually detect from heat um, the vein throbbing beneath its victim's neck as it swoops in. So as it's kind of clambering over its, the, its prey's hide, it's able exactly to target where the blood flows closest to the skin. And wow. that's through heat. The chap <laughs> amazing. The chap yeah. study just won a Nobel Prize. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be wearing uh, long sleeve shirts now whenever I go to Austin. They, yeah. In Austin, in Texas, they have a bridge and these there's like a whole mess of bats that are protected that live underneath it. And during the day, they will just all fly out. And it's like, I don't know, a million bats. It's the most amazing thing if you've ever That's seen amazing. it. But uh, yeah, that they just gives you. They never hit you. You'll stand in the middle of this throng of bats and they'll always mm -hmm. avoid you. Isn't that amazing? And they're blind, amazing. right? They're running on radar? Yeah. They're using echolocation. They're, they wow. are essentially seeing the world through sound. And the wonder of that is, is that, that you know, that they're using peeps or pitch. It's such a high ultrasound that they'll be chattering merrily above your head. Wow. To them, a cacophony of noise. And to us, absolutely nothing. Silent. Yeah. Silent swooping, but echolocating and using that sonar to see us. I heard a translation of them one time, and it was like, look at this moron. Like, what? what <laughs> Like, get on a treadmill or something, buddy. And I was like, that's really rude. You guys, are, really rude. You guys are asshole bats. And yeah, you've got, to get, you've, got to, you've got to speak bats and fly back. Yeah, well, there's that. So the human animal, we, of course, are part of the animal kingdom. What sort of uh, research did you find out about us and our comparisons to the animal kingdom? So I met people with, with exceptional senses. So take, for example, if we're talking about the very first chapter, I use, I use the peacock mantis shrimp, which is this rather bonkers crustacean that you'd find 
in the Great Barrier Reef, whose mm-hmm. sight is exceptional. He's got he's got one of the fastest and most powerful punches in the world. Gram per oh. gram, if you if you size him up to the size of Mike Tyson, he'd definitely take on Mike Tyson in a heavyweight boxing match. Probably punches lights out. Oh. So, but he but he's got exceptional sensors in his light sensors that enables him to see color in a whole new way. Oh. And so this enabled me to talk about color in our eyes and how we see color. And you and I, unless you're colorblind, probably have, so I know that I have three cones. These are three types of cones in the back of my eye. And with these three cones, I'm able to see every color in the rainbow. Mm-hmm. But there are some people, and they tend to be women. In fact, they are women because these, these cones are inherited and coded for in the sex chromosomes. And they have a fourth cone. Instead of being a trichromate like us, mm-hmm. they are a tetrachromate. And through this fourth cone, they have a whole new dimension of being able to see color. So the mm-hmm. rainbow to them is something even more spectacular. Wow. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. is that the, that's the, that's the uh, peacock mantis shrimp? That's the peacock mantis shrimp. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Story. I think there's a guy I see in TikTok who has one of these and he's always throwing stuff in it and it's punching the crap out of stuff. Like it just, it'll yeah. just kill anything. In fact, he, he, the one I learned from is you can't put your finger in there because it'll, he'll break it off. Thumb splitters. They're thumb, thumb splitters. splitters. Yeah, that's right. They, um, they are, I mean, they're not particularly big, but they have a big personality. And they've been studied. At the, Sheila Patek at the University of California, Berkeley, has studied the speed and the force of this punch. And it's mighty. Um, in fact, they have to be made. Their shell has to be so strong because, because they're so forceful. And scientists are looking at the composition of the shell to create to create uh, weaponry or kind of what is it that you wear when you're a knight in shining armor? Uh, uh, yeah, chainmail and armor. That kind of thing that's basically impregnable. Wow, that's the idea. Yeah, I've seen it at work. He he like throws like little stuff in there, and it goes it goes up to him, and then just whacks him like. And it's just it's just amazing how fast it is. But yeah, note to self: don't ever date a peacock mantis. That sounds like it's not going to end well. Let's talk about the diversity of uh, human experience. And, and you, you came across, I, I think, some people who see the world differently in Australia. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. Conchetta Antico is one of these ladies I was telling you about. She has a fourth cone. She is a tetrachromate. Holy crap. So she sees, as I said, many more colors in, in the rainbow. What's, what's extraordinary is that her daughter has a rare form of colorblindness. And this is this really got to the heart of the matter for me with regards to perception. It's a very private experience. So Conchetta can paint these exceptional landscapes full of color mm-hmm. in order to try and get you to understand what it is she's seeing. Mm-hmm. But you'll never be able to see through her eyes. <laughs> And then for her daughter, who she you know, spends time painting with, and before she realized that her daughter had this color blindness, mm-hmm. her daughter could never see what it is that Conchetta is trying to share. Oh, wow. And Conchetta, when she was born, of course, never realized that she had this exceptional vision because it's like, I thought her, it was it. Day. Wow. So, so, so it really, so, so the chapter is, it's the opening chapter of the book and it talks about the private perception of experience and the huh. Gabby Jordan, who is the scientist who dedicated her life to find one of these tetrachromate r- women. She knew, she knew about the genetics. She mm-hmm. knew that it would be possible, but of course no one had come forward saying, well, I see exceptional colors because what they see is what they see. Mm-hmm. So she dedicated her life to finding and to building. She's a trichromate. She's got regular vision. And she had to build a test to test for <laughs> colors that she couldn't see. And then she found this woman, but she has no idea what it is this woman can see. I mean, it's, it's my it's crazy. It's according, crazy. To, according to her website, she can see 100 million colors? Yeah. Holy I mean, crap. It, I think it's difficult to number them, but she is in a she's in a whole new a whole new level. She sees a whole dimension of color yeah. that is not accessible to our eyes. I've been seeing this uh, like meme or test passed around like social media, where it's like not everyone can see all the colors, and it's like a thing where you can count the colors, and it has like a palette 
yep. grape or whatever. Yep. And I wasn't sure if that was because it's the internet. So if that was yep. some sort of BS thing, but I guess some people can and some people can't. So the, absolutely. So there was a dress that hit the headlines over in Britain. Have you, do you know the dress? The, the golden the dress, exa- blue. Or the yeah. golden or the white or the black and the blue. Huh. And the, and the population was divided because half saw black and blue mm-hmm. <laughs> and half saw gold and white. So yes, you, we, we see, we see different worlds. My red might well be very different from your red. That's really extraordinary. I mean, I've had girlfriends that they, they don't like, they can go to the paint store and they can see like a million different colors, right? And those swatches that they give you. And yeah. me, I'm just like, oh, this is blue, green, red. Yeah. Like, uh, but maybe okay. you're not interested either. There's I, that, that's the maybe large you part of it. And maybe you'd rather be out across the other shop. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I remember one time we we started one of our companies and hired these employees and 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 they came in and they go, oh these the colors in the walls offend us. I'm like they're fucking white. Uh, <laughs> like what? Like, well, I I don't feel creative. And I'm like, well, paint it however you want. And if you paint it, I'll buy the paint. But other than that, get get the hell to work. And I just could never figure it out. Any, any office I ever worked at is always white. But, you know, I've, I've had girlfriends that are like, oh, this this color, I don't know, affects me. And I'm just like, well, fucking get over it. <laughs> Turn the lights out. <laughs> like, I got shit to do, man. I'm not really worried about the colors and stuff. I know. There are, I mean, but, the painting industry, the wall paint industry yeah. over in Britain is crazy. There's so many, there's so many colors white, so many shades with silly, silly acronyms. Yeah, but I, but I've but I but you know I'm I I do appreciate people that have an art thing. Mm. Like I've always created companies, but I've never created something that's like a design based company. Like when you go into a really nice restaurant, it has that beautiful ambiance and the design. I've always looked around and thought, man, you must have to hire somebody to come do this because I could never do this with a company. I could do the, like the food part and the business part, but I could yeah. never do like putting roses up or yes. making it look pretty and stuff. So it's some people really have a talent for that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting looking at Conchetta's artworks because mm-hmm. she did this whole series on Twilight when for us, the world is leached of color, mm-hmm. but for her, the subtlety of color still remains. So she's still seeing many colors in, in what to us looks very bland. Wow. That's um, going to be an interest. Maybe her world's better than mine then. Maybe that's more funner. Yeah. Because I don't know. I'm yeah. just looking at everything in black and white pretty much at this point. I might as well be a dog for all I know. What are some other aspects of the book we want to touch on? Um, Conservation, so climate about, change. We could talk about the secret senses, these senses that you might not be aware that you have. So I talk about, for example, sense of balance with the cheetah, oh, yeah. uh, sense of time with, with a trash line orb weaving spider and sense of body. This is a very interesting one. This idea that when you close your eyes, Chris, where your body is, where your limbs are and what they're doing with such precision that you can, can you do this? Can you bring your hand to your nose? Your fingertip. Oh, I think I just missed. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got it. But I'm, got I'm it. used to doing this with the when I'm drinking with a police officer. It's, well, it's it's the it's the first test, isn't it? It's a lot um, of practice. So this is, yeah. This is the police are testing whether our proprioception or our sense of body yeah. is become adult. It's easily adult with a with a glass of something nice in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this is a sense that we call on all the time throughout the day, but unknowingly. It's so automatic and so familiar, we don't notice it. In mm-hmm. fact, the only time we notice it is when it goes. And I met mm-hmm. a gentleman who suffered a really ni- nasty virus. High temperatures, felt completely strange, ended up in hospital, felt like he was floating above the bed. But they weren't normal fever dreams because when he came to, he could not feel his body. And with oh. his eyes closed, he had lost all sense of his body. Wow. He'd lost the feeling of touch. Oh, and he wow. Couldn't, yeah. He couldn't feel things, couldn't feel being felt. But also oh. he had lost his sense of body. So as if he was disembodied. Wow. Wow. So it sounds he, like Friday nights at my house after a <laughs> bottle of vodka. <laughs> so there is. And he's never had it. He's never got it back. Really? So never came back. 
Wow, that would be awful. It's, it's incredible. So yeah. he he he's a really amazing, inspirational man. And I met him and he basically, through sheer determination and will, he taught himself how to move again because this sense enables us coordinated movement. Yeah. So it wasn't that he'd lost motion. He said my arm would be backtracking off and I wouldn't know what I what was doing. It could be kind of saying hello to a nurse without him really realizing what it was doing. Mm. If he looked at it, he knew what it was doing, but mm. otherwise he couldn't feel where his limbs were. Wow. So he hadn't lost motion he'd mm. lost the ability to control motion with this sense of proprioception wow. body sense that's the excuse i have anytime i've accidentally you know bumped into somebody <laughs> i don't know what that means but yes yeah, so so ian had to in order to learn to mm. walk well to first of all sit up and then to kind of get his legs out of the bed to stand and then to walk mm -hmm. he had to break down every single motion that we take for granted. He wow. had to learn how to do, use his hands to make conversation more naturalistic. He had to teach himself gestures again. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. And hey, you're like trying to signal people and you can't do it. Wow. And you, it, incredible. So he yeah. had to reteach himself. It took years. I mean, the doctors didn't really know what to do with him because this, these cases are exceptionally rare. Mm -hmm. And today he uses vision. So his eyes take over from what the sense of body does for us. Mm -hmm. But should the lights go off, yeah. he falls like a ragdoll. The moment his eyes lose contact with his body, he loses control of his body. Holy crap. But even if he's watching fireworks up in the sky mm -hmm. and that little bit of blackness you get just after the brightness of a firework, mm -hmm. he staggers. Wow. Because that little bit of blackness has kind of interrupted his his control over his body. That's insane. Now, yeah. you also talk in your book about COVID and sensory deprivation. Did, did you have COVID or are you, you're starting to see how COVID you know, people lose some other things too? I mean, uh, sometimes smell and taste. Yeah, I, I did get COVID. This time oh. last year, I got COVID. And the first thing I that went awry was my, my cup of coffee in the morning tasted abysmal. So yes, so I talked about, I mean, the nice story in the book about that is that what we think of as taste mm -hmm. is actually mainly smell. Mm -hmm. So flavor, flavors generated by when you're chewing on your toast or you're chewing on a piece of chocolate, your tongue will taste the sweetness of the chocolate. Mm -hmm. but a lot of the aromas and the kind of chocolatiness of the chocolate, you chew and the, and the smell molecules travel around the back up into your nose. Mm. And the brilliant thing is your brain then hoodwinks you to think that that was tasted on your tongue. That retronasal smell was tasted on your tongue. Oh. The combination of smell and taste are amalgamated into flavor. Wow. I didn't so, even know that. That's a lot of work going on. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so the taste, so taste was interesting. So really, I think when I got COVID, I didn't lose taste. I lost my sense of smell mm. because coffee just tasted bitter. None yeah. of that lovely coffee and chocolate the same. I mean, so that was all grim. But the reason I wrote an article actually for the UK press, because one of the scientists in my book, uh, one of the touch scientists talks of touch as being <laughs> We're back on T talks of touch as being not a sentimental indulgence, but a biological necessity. And he's very anxious about the the, um, the isolation that many of us were in, the mm. elderly, the young, the demonization of touch mm. really concerns him. So in my book, I talk about I divided touch into two senses. Mm. Um, so the star nosed mole with its little no, little starry nose, which it uses to feel its way through burrows. That, that explains our sense of being able to feel the topography of the world, the lay of the land, feel something's r texture, shape, size. But then there is the sense of being touched, the emotions, the pleasure, the pain involved in being touched. And that's, those use different senses from the ones that I'm using to map the world. So mm. different senses. And one of these senses, I mean, skin to me became this, well, scientists have called it the last great sensory frontier, because we're still finding out about the senses in our skin. Like I said, the chap who won the Nobel Prize, who'd done that study on the vampire bat, 
but also looking at our skin and understanding how we feel pain. Mm-hmm. These are receptors and sensors within our skin that enable something to feel spicy or painful or hot or cold. And 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 the and so backtracking to the COVID, the the lack of touch and and the the worry that Francis McGlone is a scientist who who worries about the lack of touch that mm-hmm. we suffered during COVID. He's involved in studying a sensor only recently discovered in our skin that responds to a caress. Mm-hmm. And he thinks that this this sensor is is not just important in terms of social bonding and getting pleasure and touching your children, but also is important perhaps when babies are in the womb yeah. and covered with this little lanugo hair and mm-hmm. the warm swirl of the amniotic fluid in the warm womb, warm womb, Mm -hmm. um, keeps the baby, gives the baby a sense of itself. And the mother Mm. caressing the baby enables the baby to learn the difference between myself and some. So he, he thinks touch is really important in ways that we have for our psychology and our mental health in ways that we have yet to understand. I would agree with that. I mean, when you hug somebody, you kind of get that that I don't know what it is that goes in your brain dopamine or or something you get that rush of like I think we need each other as human beings to do that and maybe some of that comes from our experience in the womb and and we need we need to I don't know it helps us somehow I, so that yes. would make sense yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and yet we were all we've we've demonized touch I mean I think only now in London are we getting back to that that idea of shaking hands or or, or this or it's still it's still there's still a distance between people but. Bit by bit, I think maybe. Anyway, I think we lo- we we we've lost something vitally human throughout that period. Hopefully, we can get it back, and I don't know, repair what it was. I know my sister who is has MS. My younger sister has MS and dementia. Was trapped in her, her care center, and for like a year, my mom couldn't visit her. And you know, my mom was but goes almost every day to visit her. And it was really hard for my mom not to be able to touch uh, her daughter and make her feel secure. We could talk over the phone or Zoom or sometimes go stand outside the window. But, yeah. you know, it was life or death and she ended up getting COVID anyway. But these, these was hospitals. She okay? Was she okay? She's, she's okay. She, it, weirdly enough, she, she was asymptomatic both times. She didn't even know she had it. In fact, they just lied to her because she's got dementia. And they just said, we're putting you in a separate room because someone else has it. And we just want to make sure you're protected. And yeah. she's like, okay, well, whatever. And it was a, it was a real blessing because she's, she's a real mess in, in with the MS in the wheelchair and everything. We thought for sure if she got it, that she'd be a goner. So we're, we're real lucky. I'm yeah. sorry to hear about that, but I'm I'm delighted she was okay. But yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. but not it's being able to touch her and stuff. That, that lack of touch for yeah. your mother, but also for her. Yeah. I mean, has she talked about it? Has do you think she reacted differently? Do you? She doesn't remember. I mean, from yeah, yeah. she can have lunch and not remember she ate. So right. yeah, yeah, we're at that point. But yeah, I think my mom really believes that that not having that touch, not having being able to you know have her mom there and love and care for. Her, that she slid further into her dementia. And yeah. I think a lot of people did. And I think you mentioned that earlier in the show, a lot of old people, a lot of old people just died because, because you know, they weren't getting contact with and love and affection. Yeah. Really we hard. we saw this. Just to, Go ahead. So just to interrupt, that's something I found rather magical when I was researching touch. It's the first sense to come online in the womb. Oh, and really? it's the last sense to leave us when we die. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so I just hope someone was holding the lack of touch, particularly when people were ill or passing away. That lack of touch must have been, well, it ma- that makes me feel very upset. Yeah. the I know that a lot of the nurses, because you can bring the family in, uh, a lot of the nurses would hold hold the hands of, of uh, people when they would pass. And yeah, it's it's difficult and hard. And I can see why it's important. We get that with love and affection when we have a mate, being able to hold them, touch, cuddle, hug. There's something that that gives you that feeling of even like as a man, when my girlfriend would would sit beside me or sit in my lap, sleeping or watching a you know, Netflix or something, yeah. and and I would feel have feel like a protector, which is a yeah. male thing. We, we feel like we want to be, ah, I got this. I got, I'm protecting my family. We're, we're into that sort of thing. And yeah. that, that triggers through that touch and that feeling of that, of that modality and stuff. 
So the other, yeah. thing, the other sense that you don't have is smell because smell is super important in, in those interactions as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, what we're doing right now is a little bit sterile. I mean, you're over wherever you are and all we've got is sound and vision to rely on. Yeah. So no touch, no, I can't smell you. <laughs> well, you probably don't want to. I want to talk well, And I would be night, smelling so. you and I would be making kind of <laughs> conscious decisions and also unconscious decisions. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you don't know. I went to Taco Bell last night, so it might, there might be a smell over here. You don't want to have a thing. So but I mean, that's, that's another, that was another chapter in the book. And the unconscious, I used the giant peacock of the moth oh, um, yeah. and the discussion about pheromones. Pheromones are a bit of a oh, yeah. dirty word in the in, in su- human pheromones in scientific mm-hmm. circles. But I looked at how smell is really important. Smell is, has, a, has a privileged access mm-hmm. to the amygdala in our brain, the emotional center. Mm-hmm. So um, one neuroscientist, Rachel Hertz, hijacked brilliantly Descartes' words and said, I smell, therefore I feel. Mm-hmm. So, so again, back to being male protector, huggling up with your, your girlfriend, your mother, your sister. Smell is really important. Yeah, especially if they've had Taco Bell the night before. The would be doing that. The I know pheromones, yeah, are a big deal. Did, are women attract? I, I've heard this uh, kicking around a little bit. Are can women tell how how much testosterone you have and it, it affects their attraction? Oh golly, I don't know. I, I don't. Oh, well, there I'm, you go. Yeah, there's your next book. So. <laughs> I mean, I certainly, like I said earlier, I'll certainly be making conscious and subconscious decisions about. Yeah. But I know pheromones uh, on both sides, they're attracted to. And yes. then they put it in all sorts of perfumes and everything else. That yes. They do. There's a big market making a little bit of a nonsense out of human pheromones. I mean, they haven't yet been found or bottled, but I'm I mean, a... they're found throughout the animal kingdom. And so one, one of my scientists, Tristan Wyatt, said, it's it's ridiculous to think that they won't be found in us at some stage and they won't yeah. be involved in human courtship. The one the one example where pheromones are most likely to be a human fer- a hu- human pheromone is most likely to be found is between a mother and her baby. Mm. So there's really interesting work coming out of Normandy from Benoist Charles Laboratory and mothers release a pheromone that be- newborn babies basically ena- it enables them to latch on and find food oh, so wow. breastfeeding and it's a pheromone that is a pheromone basically is is a chemical so i could release it if i was breastfeeding a baby mm. but you could give it to another woman who is having problems the very same one that i released it's not particular to a person it's particular mm. to species mm. um anyway. i've seen i oh, i, sorry I, I have it. <laughs> I have huskies and I, my friends will breed huskies. I've seen videos where the huskies are like blind and somehow they're still able to find mom and they're able to find the nipples. Yeah. And so maybe that, maybe there's some yeah. of that in, in that sort it's of been thing. It's proven in rabbits. I know that. So mm-hmm. um, mammals, I mean, I wouldn't put it past the husky. Yeah. Cause they're just, they're blind as a bat and somehow they know where mom is and, and how to go find her when, when the milk bar opens. Yeah. Uh, it's always funny to see about 10 of them up at the, and it would the make evolutionary bar. sense. I mean, mm-hmm. it would make absolute sense, yeah. a guide, a, a sensory guide to find food because whether you feed in those first few hours of life is critical to your survival. Yeah. So, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. What are some other aspects of the book we haven't touched on? Electricity. Let's see. There's a few different things. You talk about how reality is neither true nor complete. So so that's the very end of the book. Mm-hmm. So I use the platypus as a cautionary tale. So here's an animal with a sense that we don't have. So it is able, this creature, this, the bill of this creature is studded with thousands, tens of thousands of tiny electric sensors. Really? Which it uses to detect the electric field of its prey. So it'll dive underwater, it'll close its eyes, close its ears, won't smell, and it's guided by, it basically, like, have you ever seen metal detectors? Yeah. You get them in the fields around near where I live. Yeah. You know, using their metal detector across, back and forth across the rocky bed, the duckbill platypus will wave its beak back and forth across the rocky bed and underneath detect the little animals, crustaceans and whatnot that it's going to feed on. Wow. I and did maybe- not even know that. Yeah. That's crazy, man. <laughs> They're pretty cool, the platypuses. So 
here is an animal with a sense that's completely and electricity unless we stick our hand in a socket we're not going to feel it yeah <laughs> so i might go try that with a pizza yeah. <laughs> stick my hand and see if i recognize the pizza. you can't feel the electric um, field given off by a living creature that's so, crazy so reality is only dictated by the senses that your body has. Wow. So, wow. so here's a creature with a very different sensory reality to us. And that, so that's, all, that's really it's a fun idea to leap out the book on because it shows you that your reality is neither true nor complete. Yeah. But also, and as a sci-fi way of looking at it, you could put various implants into yourself to boost your... To, to basically pick up sensory information that a human generally doesn't pick up. Mm. And because another aspect of the book is the neuroplasticity of our brain. Mm. Our brain is absolute wizard at being able to take information and, and use it. So the blind artist, Eshref Armagan, is a chap I met who paints, draws, yet has never seen anything and says that he sees the world through his fingertips. Really? And he, That's yeah. Cool. It's quite Amazing, something. and yeah. he had his brain studied by um, neuroscientists at Harvard, and they asked him when he was in the brain scanner, "Please fill this, Ashraf, and draw a picture." And they were looking at his brain as he did this, and what they saw is that his visual cortex, the part of the brain that's lighting up in your in your head and my head right now, because we're looking at one another, the visual cortex, his visual cortex when he was feeling the world, his wow. visual cortex lit up. Wow. So your brain does not lie fallow. The, 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 our brain has been carved up. Our cortex has been carved up according to what scientists think, where you hear, your auditory cortex, your visual mm -hmm. cortex. But if you can't hear and you can't see, those parts of the brain are being used by other sensory information. And for Eshref, because he used his hands so much, the visual core, he does see through his fingers, essentially. I mean, wow. it kind of interrogates, what do you mean by sight? If you're talking mm -hmm. about the fact that his visual cortex is lighting up, Eshref can see. He's blind, but he can see. Anyway, back to, back to the platypus and the kind of sci-fi idea of inputting different senses into our, um, into our brain. That is entirely possible because our, neuro, our brains are so neuroplastic. In fact, there's a brilliant book written by um, Robert Eagleman, called Live Wired, and he's very interested in, in, in this idea and hmm. is trying various plugins to enhance human. I, over the tech scene, I've bumped into various people over the years that do uh, biohacking to themselves there we and go. all sorts of different things. What do you think about like that? And like Elon Musk is evidently working on a company for bio where you can, you know, put something in your brain, you can plug it in. I mean, so, I mean, <laughs> I'd rather someone else tried it before me. I'm yeah. quite happy with my sensory umwelt. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm curious. I think it's extraordinary, but I don't know that I would particularly want to gadget myself up, app myself up, so I can I can GPS my way around, or like or like the Bartels Godwit, you know, migrate across the sea from Alaska to New Zealand on yeah. the back of uh, feeling geomagnetic fields. Well, I mean, plus... it's fun, but but I find it a bit. Um, too sci-fi for me to kind of get a yeah. get a grip on. I'm still trying to master this whole thing going on right now with myself. So yeah. you know, I don't I don't really need to add anything right now. I'm just trying yeah. to deal with this. And, and the book is about is is asking you to slow up a little bit and and okay. think about actually as we are just as we are the boring waking up in the in, in the morning boring Monday Monday morning mundane. The book is asking you to realize. The, the, the kind of wonders that are happening in the way that you're seeing color, mm. in the way that you're hearing the world, in the way that you're smelling the world through two nostrils. So you're going to kind of stereoscopic, stereoscopic smellscape. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the book is, uh, we are wonderful as is. Mm -hmm. I've got this uh, website. I'm going to watch some of her videos after we get off uh, the Conchetta and Antico. Am I pronouncing yeah. it right? But I kind of feel ripped off, eh? Like, I want to see a million colors. Like, I feel like I got, like, a low-grade old model of iPhone put in my brain. I can't see well. Like, what kind of crap is this? Can I... Can I ask for a refund or a receipt or something like that? <laughs> so you need to, you need to call Elon Musk and ask for the rainbow vision goggles. Hello, hello God. 
<laughs> what the hell, man? You gave me but it might um, give you a headache. Who knows? Too that's much. True. I don't know. Maybe yeah. Maybe seeing too many colors would be. I don't know. If I want to see a lot of colors, I'll just drink a lot of vodka and drop some mushrooms or something. I don't know. Take Nestle. some acid. Yeah, yeah. There are other ways. <laughs> that's probably there the are, way to do it. But, yeah. <laughs> There, there are other ways that you can wake up from. <laughs> yeah, we call that Wednesdays around here. So there you go. Uh, anything more you want to tease out on the book before we go? Golly, I mean, I mean, I suppose one of the big messages that I'd like people to uh, get is that is the is back to the point I made at the very beginning that we're one big family. I mean, conservation and looking after our planet is very much in the news. And I suppose the book brings home the point. I mean, what staggered me was all these similarities, sensory similarities, say between us and the vampire bat in the proteins that enable us to feel heat or feel pain being the same, Mm -hmm. or the opsins, the little uh, proteins in the back of our eye that enable us to see being the Mm -hmm. same as all these creatures. I mean, I found endless echoes of ourself throughout the animal kingdom, or rather endless echoes of them in me. So that is that is one world. We are one family philosophy. Yeah. I'm going to still keep killing the family members that I have their spiders and mosquitoes, though. That's not going to end. <laughs> Do you know, I've on Twitter, there were a couple of people who were a, a bit upset by my <laughs> sense of time, sense of time chapter, because there is a, it's a spider that tells the story. Oh, really? The phobes got upset. I mean, I'm not, I'm a little bit scary. I've held tarantulas, Uh but I can't, the the smaller spindly ones still get me. But I, but they were, they were rather wonderful. It's quite, I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy to see, to see the wonder in a spider, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, as long as they're outside my house, we're cool. Yeah. When you come in (laughs) without an invite, you don't wipe your feet, then we have a problem. Especially if you're, if you've poisonous, then, you know, that's kind of the thing. Because I've got dogs, and so I don't, I don't ever want the dogs to, to get it. I remember one time I found a giant uh, black widow right above my dog's water. It was a brand new puppy I'd bought in two, and so oh. it would have been really just not cool. But aside from spiders, now they're running off everyone. Everyone's like arachnophobia. So give us your plugs one more time so people can find you on the interwebs and get to know you better. Thank you, Chris. So the book is sentient, and you can find me on Twitter. And also on Instagram under J.M. Higgins. There you go. And thank you for coming on the show today. We certainly appreciate it. We've, I've learned a lot. And I'm going to go have to call up God and get angry with him that I'm not getting 100 million colors on my TV. <laughs> I'm going to try adjusting my radar or something or my antenna. I think you're wonderful just the way you are. Oh, well, thank you. You're the only one. Even my mom doesn't like me. So <laughs> thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Go order the book wherever fine books are sold as sentient How Animals Illuminate the Wonder of Our Human Senses, February 2-22 coming out. That's, or, let's see, do, let me do this right. 2-22-22 coming out. This is it's funny. a proper palindrome. Yeah, let's like, oh. get this lucky. <laughs> There you go. There you go. <laughs> so order that baby up. You can get it. So what's today? Today's the 12th. So yeah, you can get it ahead of time for your book club. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss. See the bell and, uh, see everything we're reading and reviewing over there. YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, bell notification. All our groups, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Stay safe, be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time. Chris, thank you.